Okay, we have all the witnesses. Right, we can make a start. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a, an evidence session for the uh, Devolution All Party Parliamentary Group, our inquiry into um, devolution. It's our fourth uh, oral evidence session. Uh, welcome, our witnesses. I'm going to ask to introduce themselves in a minute. I'm Clive Betts, MP. Um, I'm stepping in today for Andrew Lua, who is uh, chair of the group, uh, though I'm also chair of the uh, HCLG Select Committee, which is also looking at devolution uh, at present. Uh, I think it's an, uh, an issue of considerable importance and one we want to um, explore uh, and find uh, the right way to go about it um, and ensure that we have more devolution, I think, uh, in this country. Now, I just encourage everyone, and there are a lot of people um, who have been listening into our sessions, um, to tweet about the session, tagging at APBG devolution, uh, and also to uh, note that the uh, session is being recorded. Um, and just say to uh, everyone who is, is watching uh, yeah, and uh, involved, if you could uh, switch off um, your microphones when other people are talking, it, it helps with the uh, reception. Right, let's go over to our witnesses uh, and ask them to uh, introduce themselves in the uh, order that they are going to appear before us. Uh, Lord Moylan, introduce yourself, please. Thank you. So you're on, you're on mute. So you have to, okay. I'm Daniel Moylan. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, as you can see well. from the paper you've been provided with, um, I was formerly Deputy Chairman of Transport for London, and I was also Deputy Leader of Kensington and Chelsea Council between 2000 and 2011. And um, I, I sat on the board of Crossrail in the past uh, and also worked collaboratively with London boroughs um, uh, in relation to transport and environment through London councils, where Thank I chaired that part of it. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, uh, now if we, we can move on to uh, uh, Deborah Cadman. Deborah. Thank you. I'm Deborah Cadman. I'm Chief Executive of the West Midlands Combined Authority. Prior to that, I've worked across all levels of government, district, uh, district councils, county councils. I was Chief Exec of the Regional Development Agency, and I've also been a special advisor into government. So um, I'm working back at a regional level now. Uh, it's been an interesting journey, and I think it's probably allowed me a, a view that is pretty unique. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Kate Canali. Kate. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kate Canally and I'm the Chief Executive of Cornwall Council, um, which is uh, a large unit tree that was the first to secure a non uh, a, rural, a rural devolution deal without the requirement for a combined authority or directly elected mayor. Thank you. Thank you to the three witnesses. And let's uh, begin, if we could, with Lord Moyle. If I could begin with the first question to you. Um, uh, say, uh, you, you've had experience, obviously, considerable experience in local government. Um, we're still a fairly centralised country and, and Whitehall tends to um, pull the, have the purse strings and uh, um, give, give the direction as to what it wants to see come from local authorities. So how do you think um, Whitehall can enable local authorities to deliver on infrastructure, uh, housing, hospitals, schools, um, what, what do you think should be the role there, both for the centre and at local level? Well, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me. It's a very great honour. And also, I read your questions in advance, and they're, they're very good and complex questions. And I shall try to give them short, if slightly, perhaps slightly controversial answers. And I'm going, to, I'm going to avoid answering your first question exactly as you posed well, it. That's a good start trying anyway. <laughs> trying, trying, because I think that would be a very long answer, but trying to identify what I, what I think is the biggest weakness of local authorities in delivering large-scale infrastructure projects and suggesting that this might be an area for Whitehall to look at if it wants to help. Um, and that is um, local authorities um, really have very poor, um, and I say this even about my own local authority, very poor project management skills and um, have no real experience at being a good client in an effective way. And I drew, drew that contrast myself from when I moved from local authority to working at TFL, which of course with much larger projects in hand does understand project management as a discipline. Um, I, I often say to people, 
if you, if you had a, a bit of money and, and some land and you decided to build your own house, would you turn to your local authority to, to deliver it for you? And, and of course, the answer is no, because you wouldn't expect to have the skills. Mm. But when it comes to delivering a thousand houses, we seem to think it's absolutely the easiest thing in the world just to hand it to a local, the job to a local authority and expect them to get on with it. So I think that Whitehall really needs to think, if it wants to enable this, it really needs to think about helping local authorities develop the skills and the experience to be both a good client and good project managers. I, I can understand some of those points uh, very mm. clearly, but if I, was, uh, if I was looking where to go to for advice about how to run major projects, uh, and I look round at various uh, <laughs> uh, IT schemes or um, purchasing defence <laughs> um, for, for warships or whatever, would I really go to central government for that advice? Well, you might not go for that advice. And you might, again, <laughs> no, but the short answer is no, you wouldn't go to them for that advice. But if you were sitting in Whitehall and you were saying, what is it that I can do that is most going to enable local authorities to, ma to deliver large-scale infrastructure projects, I would say it is in the skills area right. that, that you would look, uh, if you see what I mean. And yep, it doesn't yep. mean to say that Whitehall would then be the teacher of those skills um, mm. or, or, or whatever, but you would say that's the deficiency that I'd be most concerned about. Okay, I think that's, that, that, that's a very helpful point. But uh, just, just moving slightly further on to your own particular London experience, uh, most areas outside London would look at the um, powers on, on transport and funding that London's got and say, please, could we have it as well? Um, wh why do you think other regions have been able to get to the same place London has uh, on transport? Well, well, this won't necessarily be a welcome answer to everybody, but the fact of the matter is that topography really, and really does count. So yeah. geography, yeah. geography, population, uh, and, and how a transport system works really are determined by where you are. London is a huge city and it has been built around a fixed transport network that was started to be built 150 plus years ago. This is the rail network um, 150 plus years ago and was itself the driver for development and intensification of population. And, and without that transport network, that rail transport network, London simply could not operate as, an, as the sort of economic entity it has been until the recent COVID crisis. I'm ignoring COVID for this purpose. Whereas if you go to other parts of the country, I originally myself come from Birmingham. If you go to other parts of the country in Birmingham, you see that they have built a fixed road network with very little rail. I mean, when I was a child in Birmingham, nobody ever went anywhere by rail. It's much better now. There's much, there are much better rail services for Birmingham and the West Midlands. Um, but you built a, a road network. You have much less intense concentration of population. If you look at transport for the north and the area it covers, in order to get even a, a quarter of the population that London has got, you have to throw in Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, and, and try and link all of those up. Now, there comes a point where you have to say, is that big rail investment driven by a strong strategic authority, which is the idea behind TfL, actually the best way for people to communicate and transport themselves in, in areas where you have a much less dense population? And if I was to be provocative, I'd say something like giving everyone their own car would be cheaper. Um, and so in many cases, giving them their own car and their own driver would be cheaper mm. than actually building some of the rail projects that are envisaged, given the, the fact that the demand for those, the, the, the passenger demand simply doesn't exist and is unlikely to, even if people travel much more than they do at the moment. And this combined with investment in broadband and telecommunications, you, one really needs to think intelligently and, and seriously about what it is different parts of the country need. And it really isn't always the same as what London's got. Okay, can we move on to uh, Baroness Eaton, Margaret? Yes, hello. Uh, what hello, Baroness. Do you, hello. What barriers do you think currently exist in Whitehall that are frustrating the scope and scale of local devolution? Well, I have no... This is the question I... I really feel I have the least to contribute on because I, I don't see the world from a Whitehall perspective. But if I were to say something, it, it, it comes down to this. In the end, 
it's always been the case and always been the problem. Well, not always the problem, but it's been the problem with local government since the 1960s, shall we say. It's been the case that he who pays the piper calls the queue. And you, you know that from your local government experience, as I do. And the fact is that in the 1960s, the government entrusted uh, local authorities with delivering a very, very massive house building program for the first time, which of course the local authorities weren't in a position to pay for. So the government paid for it through a mixture of grant and debt, much of that debt still, of course, notionally on the books. Um, and, and it paid for it and it entrusted it to local authorities. But it, that, was the, that was the tipping point when local authorities in this country ceased to be sort of independent um, entities, with their own views, um, and started to become delivery vehicles for central government. And, and since then, as you know, Margaret, in all sorts of ways, and in the most minute ways, um, whenever government gives uh, money to local authorities, it comes with so many strings attached, so many best practices, so many reports that have to be written, that you are effectively being reduced to an agent of government. Now, how you get away from that when it is in fact the government providing the money and the government can say legitimately that we have a responsibility at a national level to taxpayers to account for how this is going. How you get away from that with this imbalance of funding is, is I think, a really serious question. Right, over to uh, Baroness uh, Thornhill. Dorothy. Mm, that's very interesting. I, I like your candor. Um, Lord, Lord, I've got nothing to lose. Uh, I've got nothing you, to lose. <laughs> will you forgive me if I'm equally candid back? Having, yes, of course. Um, had a rail project approved um, under uh, the current Prime Minister um, from TFL, yes. who were our delivery vehicle for delivering yes. this uh, MetLine, Metline extension. Um, it seemed to me that the issue there was actually around political interference. So we seem to have, you know, political argument that you're not actually allowed to put on the table, but kind of is behind it. Um, and given what we're like about costs and the politics of things, um, more devolution, is it a hindrance? Is it going to help or, 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 make it, or, or make it worse in terms of arrangements for dealing with devolved transport bodies? Well, if you're talking about the Croxford link, Croxley. On the Metropo Croxley yeah, link yeah, on the yeah, Metropolitan yeah. Line. Yeah, well, I can tell you all about that. That was a complete Another time. time. <laughs> Another, Another time. time. I mean, I had no business case whatsoever. But um, we'll come back to that. I think that was a project created by politics rather than destroyed by politics. Um, but, but anyway, to, to come back to your more pertinent question, the biggest and most important thing that bodies... Uh, public bodies, be they local authorities or transport authorities like TFL or whatever, the biggest thing that they need in order to deliver um, um, infrastructure projects efficiently is not the quantum of money, but the certainty of investment over the ensuing years. Mm -hmm. So as to be able to commission it and deliver it and know that they are going to have uh, at least the promised funding there, not necessarily because they, if they overrun, that's another matter if the budget's overrun. But, but you, you simply cannot build in the way that London Underground was funded, for example, in the 1990s, which was on an annual grant. You simply cannot do that. You have to have a long-term commitment to funding. And in most cases, at least for rail projects and roads, that is likely to be the government funding it. There are other types of projects, of course, infrastructure projects, where um, private sector money, bank debt, and things like that might be appropriate. But you have to know that the money is going to be there to see you through, because otherwise you're in a position of stop-start and you simply cannot deliver anything. And this is where I think the National Infrastructure Commission's report, which came out last year and to which the government responded today as part of the strategy, the, 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 the spending review. And I haven't read the government's response, by the way, because I haven't had a chance to do so since the Chancellor spoke at lunchtime. But this is what, which I think is terribly, terribly important because what Sir John Armit and the National Infrastructure Commission have been arguing for is a little bit like overseas aid, a sort of fixed commitment of a certain 
quantum of GDP, a certain percentage of GDP, to infrastructure investment every year over the long term. And then it becomes a question of deciding, well, what are your priorities? What are you going to use that money for? And there are a very wide range of priorities in the National Infrastructure Commission's um, view, including broadband, electricity supply, some things that wouldn't be of interest to local authorities and so on, and not necessarily thought of as part of devolution necessarily. But um, that, I think, is absolutely crucial to um, getting infrastructure projects built um, um, if, with, with any hope of efficiency and timeliness of delivery. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're going to pass on to Councillor Maurice Bright. Uh, Maurice. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chairman. Um, do you think, is it still appropriate, um, Lord Moreland, that the focus towards devolving powers seems to relate more to growth and infrastructure rather than perhaps social services such as welfare and health? I think this is one of the most interesting questions. I, I think all these questions are really very, very interesting. This is one of the most interesting questions. And um, I think you're absolutely right to put your finger on this. Um, what else could you devolve? Um, and here I just note, but I, I speak in ignorance because I haven't really followed it up, but I note that a couple of years ago, three years, four years ago, George Osborne announced that he was devolving responsibility for health to Greater Manchester as part of the devolution deal. Now, I've never personally explored what that actually meant in detail or how it's worked out, but if I were doing an inquiry myself into this, question, um, I would start with seeing what that actually meant, because health seems to me a very promising area. We have a national health service, which is excellent in itself, that's fine, but the, the, the counterpart of being a national health service is a, a lack of flexibility in response to local demand. And then there are other areas where you could think of devolution, and here I mention something that might be regarded as a bit controversial. Um, which is the benefit system. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, na benefits are paid at national rates, but it isn't always necessarily the case that those national rates are appropriate to local economies. The purchasing power effect of benefits in different parts of the country is different. And if you had regional devolution of benefits budgets, um, it would allow regional authorities to think um, flexibly about how much of that could be, would be going to direct benefits, how much at the margin might be determined to what might be locally appropriate employment schemes and re-employment schemes. And I think you get some very interesting devolved solutions um, out of that sort of approach. But these are quite sensitive areas. But health and benefits, I think, are two areas that should certainly be looked at. If I can just follow up, that's, that's a really interesting answer. I was listening uh, on the way in. Uh, to... I've, got, I, I've also got to watch my phone because we are uh, meant to be voting here. In yes, Paris. I did hear. Oh, a is born, if Dorothy did mention. Yes. Uh, and it's eaten. Anyway, suddenly yeah, it could just be me and Clyde. It, 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 it's coming up, but not yet. No, no, no. We're not, we'd, we're not allowed to go and vote in lobbies. Yeah. We have to vote on our telephone. Well, that's all right. Oh, we don't have to leave the meeting at oh, all. Oh, fine. It's, no, ridi it's ridiculous. I get very lonely. Very quick, very quick follow-up, <laughs> uh, Clive, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I was listening to Sally Khan on LBC, the Mayor for London, who was saying something along the lines of the, the, the frustration about the government not necessarily giving a, a pay rise to certain staff um, um, in the public sector um, was that the average salary of £24,000 the national salary in London actually doesn't equate to a great deal, whereas it has more buying power elsewhere. Are you saying something similar in relation to benefits? Well, it's, it's certainly the case that there are part, there are certain locations in the country, not very many, but there are certain locations in the country where um, the private sector barely operates. Like I could name, I'm not going to name one or two, but I know one or two. Um, because... Um, uh, because the, the, what, what, what a small shopkeeper can afford to pay for an assistant is not that much above the national benefit level that is paid. So it, it really becomes a very marginal choice whether you want employment or not. And I think that you're, that you're right. Just as, and, and that's often combined in some, in some places. That's combined with areas where in the 1960s and 70s, large numbers of civil servants were moved out. 
Um, so you get two economies in the same city. Well, you're either employed by the, by the government uh, to do a job in the civil service, or you're taking benefits because the private sector in the middle um, can't compete at either end, neither with the national pay rates. Be, I know there's a London waiting for the civil service, but otherwise it's national pay rates, either with the national pay rates at one end or the national benefits at the other. And this isn't necessarily contributing to employment and the prosperity of the people who fall between the two. I think that's worth, controversial though it is, I think it's worth raising that point and asking if benefits, and indeed I would say civil service pay, I think Khan has a point, need to be, should be uh, decided at national level when regional settlements might be much more appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much indeed for that, Lord Moylan. When certainly on the, the select committee, when we looked at this, I think there's always a smile crosses our faces when we ever come to DWP because, apart from the Department for Education, I think that I can't think of another government department that is more resistant um, to actually uh, devolving anything. So, yes, no, no, I'm sure you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. uh, uh, and indeed, the National Health Service is quite good at seeing off. Um, yes. Um, local um, local responsiveness as well. well. But, but um, thank you very I'm very much grateful to you for allowing me to um, um, possibly annoy you with some of those um, answers. Right. But um, I hope if it contributes to your um, program of re research and inquiry, I'm glad to have been of help. Yeah. Stimulators, I think, would be the word I would use. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Move on now to our, our, our next, wist, next witness. I, I, uh, I will drop off now if I... If, uh, I okay, yeah, yeah absolutely fine. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank over you. to Deb McCabman, as Chief thank Exec you. of uh, West Midlands uh, Combined Authority. Um, very uh, welcome to you. And uh, could I just begin by asking... Um, yeah, and I'm sure the answer will be yes, but uh, should, should the powers of the combined uh, authorities be enhanced? Um, what, in which areas, what, what, do you, what would you like to see, say in five years' time, the combined authorities actually look like? So, so I, my initial response to that is, that is that, yes, of course, I believe that the powers for combined authorities should be enhanced. But... but it can't just be about powers. It's also got to be about financial devolution as well in, in all of its guises. Um, and, and the areas specifically that I, I, I believe we could, we could do more on are around skills. Um, uh, I think we need full budgetary and policy responsibility for the further education and skills ecosystem, which would include all post-16 technical education and I think it would allow us to create a much more agile and responsive skill system to improve the supply of higher level, high growth skills leading to higher employment. Now, that's going to be more and more important as we come out of COVID. Yeah. So in the region, you, you know, uh, in the West Midlands, we will be one of the regions most severely affected by COVID in terms of unemployment rates and, and specifically um, youth unemployment, which is going to be a big challenge for us. The, the other area that, that and, and a frustration for us is that we are only responsible for part of the education skills system. And if I explain what I mean by that, so we really care in the West Midlands around, about early years education. And if you look at the statistics uh, in the West Midlands, um, over a third of our young people under four are not school ready. Now, you know what that means. They, they can't eat uh, with an eye for thought. They can't speak properly. They can't communicate. And in, in, in some cases, they're still presented at school wearing nappies. So that disadvantage lasts throughout all of their education career. So by the time we're responsible for them at the age of 17, 18 for skills, you know, we, we have to invest a lot just to get to compensate for the disadvantage. Yet if we had a, a, a more um, involved uh, role uh, in the whole of the system, we could make it far more effective. So skills, I think, is the first area where we would like to see um, more powers, but equally more funding as well. 
And then, of course, with transport, um, I, I believe we could, we could respond really positively to enhanced powers and local responsibility for the development, management and operation of our transport system. Now, this would, this would help on a number of fronts. It would help with recovery from COVID, but it would also enable us to deliver faster and smarter on our net zero um, uh, agenda, but also, more importantly, deliver the connectivity that we need across the region to connect the most deprived communities into um, uh, homes and work uh, and skills. And then the final uh, area, of course, is a, a consolidated long-term infrastructure budget um, that would allow us to, to support the government in its levelling up, uh, levelling up agenda. Just asking about the, the relationship between mayor, combined authority, local authorities. Um, is there a danger that, it, particularly if central government doesn't want to give way, that devolution becomes not devolution but centralisation within uh, a combined authority area and powers get pulled up from individual authorities into uh, the combined authority and towards the mayor? Uh, indeed, when we talk about devolution, we're only, we, we only end up talking these days, don't we, about devolution to mayors and combined authorities, not about individual authorities, which in many parts of the country are the only form of local government around. So, so we're, we're having really interesting conversations in the West Midlands at the moment about, about what devolution truly means. And, and I do have to say, in, in, in a lot of cases, devolution from government to the West Midlands feels more like decentralisation than true yeah. devolution. But yeah. equally, that there is a really interesting and important conversation had around double devolution and the right spatial level for delivering, investing in and delivering services. So we're very mindful and sensitive to the fact that there are a number of things, number of services that, that are far better to deliver, to be delivered at a local authority level rather than at a regional level and vice versa. And the most interesting, the most important thing is, is that you're able to have those conversations. Right, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to move on now to uh, look at relations between the, the centre and local authorities. Um, Dorothy, Dorothy Thorne. Yeah, that segues quite ni nicely in there, Deborah. Um, uh, first of all, it really, it's looking at it from your unique perspective, yeah. um, you know, which, which in a way is, is, is fascinating. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? Um, we know there are barriers between local and, and, and national and there are tensions, some are healthy tensions, some aren't. Um, but a lot of it seems to be around trust, lack of trust in local authorities' abilities to deliver um, and, and that kind of thing. What changes do you think we in local authorities could make and also Whitehall to actually um, ch you know, change this whole approach to devolution, which seems to be happening. We're thawing, but what do you see as the main things to, to on both sides actually to actually uh, enable better working? Yeah, uh, and it's really good to see you, Baroness. Yes, oh, thank well, you. Yeah, too. It's, a long time. it's good to see <laughs> yeah. you. Um, I, think, I think the first thing I would say is that you, you know people view all of this as a zero sum game. You know, so there is a sense that that if, if, if central government de devolves um, uh, powers and money from the centre to the regions or to local authorities, then they've lost. Instead of us saying, look, it's not, it's not a, a kind of vertical operation here, it's, it's more of a horizontal operation. So, so it's, about, it's not a zero-sum game, it's about being thoughtful about who is best placed to deliver all those things that we all care passionately about, you know, making sure that young people have jobs and are, are employed, that we deal with some of the really tricky um, social cohesion issues, that we deal with some of the, the economic restructuring challenges that we're going to have post-COVID and the health of our communities, etc., etc. These are all things that we care about and we all want the same thing. But what we seem what we seem to find difficulty in is accepting that there are organizations or levels of delivery that are be better placed to deliver some of these things rather than simply all from the center. And I've, I think if there's one thing we've learned from this pandemic um, amongst awful things, but one of the things that certainly I've learned from this pandemic is that you cannot deliver all of the really challenging services and responses from Whitehall. 
you know, and we've seen that play out in the ability to shield, to, you know, to, to distribute PPE, you know, to, to, to have a really responsible um, response to uh, supporting our businesses in, in our regions. So the conversation now needs, needs to be okay in terms of recovery and, and all of the regions working with our local authorities have all produced really brilliant recovery plans. You know, the conversation with government now needs to be, these are the plans that we believe should be implemented in order to recover both our communities and our uh, economies. So, how, so the conversation now needs to be, how do we do that collectively? So it's not this zero sum game, you're not giving up for something, actually you're contributing to something that we believe is the right thing to do. If we're all going to come out of this awful uh, pandemic um, positively with, with hope and aspiration for the, for the future and dare I say economic growth, which is what we're going to need. So I do get frustrated that, that there is this inability to, you know, there's this view that we're giving things up and losing things instead of seeing it from a different end of the telescope, which is actually we're, con we're all contributing to the same thing in a different way. So put very bluntly, what you're saying is local authorities have to demonstrate that, that we can do it. In a sense, it's down to us to prove that it works. And COVID was perhaps a good, a good opportunity for us to prove that it worked. And, and, and Baroness Thornhill, you know, I have been, you, 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 know, uh, you know, I've worked in local authorities for, yeah. for a long time and I have been completely overwhelmed by the response that, that the seven Mets in the West Midlands, the response that those authorities have made to this pandemic. It has been heroic and absolutely phenomenal. And I think, you know, if, if central government can't, can't see the contribution that local authorities make to these kind of crises now, I, I don't think they ever will. I mean, it has been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Right, moving on to continue to explore this relationship between central and local government. Baroness Eaton, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, you spoke uh, about the ambitions that you see for combined authorities. Uh, how can Whitehall and local government jointly ensure that local and combined authorities have the resource, the capacity and the skills to take on these new responsibilities? So, so I, I think this centres really around the, the conversation that I mentioned before around recovery and, um, and, and also addressing um, the, the country's um, need to level up. I mean, I, I think for, for a variety of reasons, some of the really big cha challenges and the spotlight that was shone on Black Lives Matter, but it exposed a whole series of uh, inequalities across our our communities and regions, not, not necessarily from a race perspective, but also, you know, the impact of COVID on our communities has also shone a spotlight on some of the huge inequalities um, and, and the levels of poverty and deprivation that we're seeing across our regions and across the country. And I think we've got to address that, you know, and I think the levelling up agenda will take us um, a significant way uh, to doing, to addressing that. But, but my my view is that um, central government will only achieve that real authentic sense of levelling up if it does it with and through local government. And, and, I, and I do think that's a really important point and, and, and investing in local government and uh, mayoral combined authorities to enable able them to jointly deliver um, uh, the services and make the investment in the right way, in the right place at the right time is going to be critical. And I do believe, uh, Baroness Eaton, that, that central government can't, can't do that from Whitehall. It's got to work hand in hand with localities to make sure that the levelling up um, uh, aspirations are really true and uh, deliver what they need to do, which is closing the productivity gap, closing um, uh, the poverty gap, but but also uh, I would I would argue giving places real hope and aspiration, um, and and I think that the, at the heart of this is all of the recovery plans that the regions and local authorities are, if they haven't done already, are are in the, in the process of pulling together. So we are saying in order to recover, these are the things that need to be done. Some of it could be based on community 
Some of it could be based on uh, businesses. Some of it could be based on the really big structural investment investments, uh, infrastructure investments that we need to make. But, but in order for those to be right, it's got to be done hand in hand, I would argue, with localities. Thank you. Okay, um, Kobe's been mentioned quite a few times. Uh, so over to Councillor Maurice Bright. Maurice, uh, to explore uh, Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, how effective, Deborah, was Whitehall support for your authority during COVID? Because is there anything that could have been improved, anything that went particularly well, anything to learn from? Um, so so the, the, the combined authority is essentially uh, responsible for, uh, for transport skills and um, uh, for housing in infrastructure. Um, and, and also uh, our relationship with and support for businesses. So, so uh, um, in hindsight, and if I had a magic wand, I, I would have liked to have seen um, government working closely with mayoral combined authorities around how we support businesses over and above the business support grants that were devolved down to, to local authorities. Um, my Mayor Andy Street has been absolutely clear about his role in supporting businesses. We have an a, um, economic impact group which we meets weekly where we bring businesses and businesses representatives together so we can be absolutely clear about the challenges they're facing but more importantly what we need to do in order to encourage them to both uh, uh, develop resilience throughout this uh, lockdown but more importantly have some vision about how they're going to survive and grow coming out of it and and i think the government engaging with us more on that i think would have been a, a lot more helpful um public transport um, i mean uh, you know m my view is is we've we've done a an absolutely heroic um thing in ensuring that our public transport system remained up and running uh, so we were able to get all of those people that worked on the front line to their jobs and home again safely and, and keeping those deprived communities across the region completely connected um, uh, into businesses and when uh, young people went back to school and colleges they were able to get to and from their places of study. Um, but, you know, the patronage plummeted, as you know, um, so, so the fare box income uh, fell through the roof, bus, bus operators are, are, you know, on the edge of sustainability. So, so again, the, the, you know, just more thought about financial support for transport authorities during this time, but, but thinking about how those transport authorities can survive and continue post-pandemic, I think would have been uh, would have been incredibly helpful. And again, we're, we're, in, we're having some uh, interesting conversations at the moment with the Department for Education and the rest of government and DWP. And what I would say actually is we've got a very good relationship with DWP. We'd like more devolved, but actually in terms of employment support, we've got a very good relationship in, in the West Midlands with DWP. But, but the issue now is, is, is the next step, which is how do we support and encourage and enable our people um, uh, coming out of, of COVID to get the skills or to be reskilled um, uh, coming out of uh, unemployment and furlough. Uh, thank you very very quick supplementary. Looking back, <laughs> looking back uh, this past year, uh, when we eventually come out of all this, do you think this year will have actually been positive for devolution or negative for devolution, and why? Everything that's happened, things that we've learned, do you think government will be more inclined or less inclined? Uh, at a practical level and uh, an ability to respond to both uh, to both the pandemic and to to create and deliver a very focused plan for recovery, I think uh, devolution and mayor or devolved authorities in particular will be able to demonstrate their value and their worth absolutely and I, again as I, as I uh, mentioned uh, to, to Baroness Thornhill. The ability of local authorities to demonstrate their ability to um, uh, to respond to the pandemic in a in a completely phenomenal way, uh, I think that will only demonstrate to central government that they need local delivery and local policy development uh, and and delivery as well. So so I think perversely, and I wish we hadn't 
I wish it hadn't taken a pandemic to get to this point, but perversely, I think devolution and local delivery of uh, services has come out more positively, I would hope, in central government. Thank you very much, thank you. Right, and thank you, and thank you, um, Deborah, for coming and giving us to us. That's, oh, wouldn't it? My pleasure. Uh, yeah. just, just a second, sorry. Uh, Dorothy, you've got an additional Yeah, Chair, given that we've got then, Kate right. next, given that yep. Kate's next, is a question I feel is kind of itching to be asked of Deborah, which Go is on. about the mayoral model. And I feel that whilst there's no doubt that the public have now recognised that the mayor is the person who speaks up for our area, um, what about the whole accountability uh, thing with a mayoral model? How has that worked and has it worked well or are there things that could be done differently? So, so again, Baroness Sulher, th th this is a really interesting um, question. And, and I say that because um, we've spent a lot of time as, a, as an M9 and that's the mayoral, uh, the nine mayors. Uh, and chief execs talking about mm. both the responsibilities and accountabilities of, of a uh, mayoral combined authority, and um, one of and, and it's and it's a, a, a really interesting conversation with central government. So central government will say, "Well, we're not going to give you this because you're you're not the ones that are held accountable for delivery," and we're saying in return, quite quite forcefully actually, we should be held accountable for all of these things. You know, it shouldn't be the permanent secretary yeah. or the minister that's before the pack. Actually, it should be the mayor. And, you know, if, if, if it isn't a zero-sum game, and if you are saying, actually, we do acknowledge that delivery of, of um, some of these services around skills, housing and transport should be done at a, a regional and local level, then if you accept that, then you also have to pass over the accountability. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know any of those nine mayors that would refuse to accept the accountability for the delivery of those services. Hence your comments about decentralisation rather than devolution. Absolutely. Epitomises yeah. it in that Thank chain. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for that. And that's just brought us nicely to time. So we do uh, move on now to uh, Kate Canale, who's... Uh, from, from Cornwall, where you have a different model uh, of devolution. So we can probably uh, explore that as well with you. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us. Uh, could I just be begin by talking a bit about uh, infrastructure, particularly uh, transport infrastructure? Uh, I mean, clearly, for, for Cornwall, this is a really important issue. Um, do you think that uh, in your situation, or generally for local authorities, more, more devolution should, be, should happen? Uh, and if it's devolution, should it just be about powers or should it be about funding as well? Well, thanks very much. So, um, and thank you for sharing the questions with me in advance, which has given me a chance to give some consideration uh, around this. I was interested listening to the first witness sort of re response uh, to this. And as a large unitary council um, whose geography um, obviously plays an important part in shaping how we respond, um, I would say that the short answer to issues of infrastructure is absolutely to be working across with uh, local authorities, giving us the powers uh, to support infrastructure delivery. Um, and I think it is funding and it is powers. And, you know, I have a really good example within Cornwall of um, making a significant investment into the A30. That's our main strategic route into Cornwall um, that was uh, never kind of quite got up to let's make it happen with, through government prioritisation. Um, and indeed, through Highways England, they costed the scheme at being around 120 million to deliver. It was so important to us within Cornwall um, that we really lobbied hard and said we will deliver that road on behalf of Highways England. Uh, we were able to come to an agreement with Highways England to deliver a duelling on their behalf at uh, half the price that Highways England had quoted it for um, and we were able to take on doing all of the kind of the design work because we knew the area much more in terms of Highways England uh, and we we're able to bring that scheme forward which is unlocking economic growth. So I think that there is a real need for clear partnership working um, and in respect to transport the subnational transport bodies are are starting to try and build that strategic knowledge um, and uh, partnership working. But 
linking that to greater powers, I think, is necessary. And I think that there is a whole succession of research reports that make that case. There's Grant Thornton's recent place-based growth report. Um, there's also recent research that UK Onward did that found that the most growth in enhancing spending at the moment is, always, is going to the places that are already the most productive. And that chimes with some of the analysis that we've done through Britain's leading edge, which is um, 12 upper tier authorities that tend to be geographically on the edge of our country, um, places that don't have large cities, that don't tend to have um, those new devolution models, that found that actually um, uh, there, that this policy corridor is shaping um, where funds are going to, and that's to the expense of, of, of uh, other, other areas that need some of that infrastructure funding. And I, I also, in thinking about this question, what's really striking for us at the moment is thinking about what replaces European structural funds, because of course in Cornwall, as a less developed region, they have been really important. And they were obviously there in place to achieve convergence between the least developed regions of Europe and for a place like Cornwall, um, they have really been the only long-term source of large-scale funding for place-based growth. And without that European funding, we wouldn't have had a regional airport, we wouldn't have the innovation centres, we wouldn't have the dual carriageways or the university or the super fast broadband. Um, and I think that actually our devolution deal did give us more control over that EU funding because we gained intermediate body status. And it meant that we could match our EU funds to a whole host of um, local priorities such as renewable energy, deep geothermal, um, that were there in our infrastructure, in our, in our uh, local industrial strategy. Um, so I would hate to see some of that rolling back um, through how the Shared Prosperity Fund uh, operates. Uh, to see some of those important sources of infrastructure funding being made um, at a national level. I think we've got a range of examples about how we have helped to unlock place-based growth. Uh, we've done it through devolution of bus franchising powers where we've used to lever 17 million of private investment into our bus network and create an integrated public transport system in a rural area which is not without its challenges. Um, and I think that we are calling for further powers to plan and develop new garden village communities so that we can provide the homes and public infrastructure that people need without overdeveloping some of our small historic kind of towns and villages. So, so the answer is yes. And I think that there are areas that we can point to in terms of uh, European funds around how that's been deployed is so important to be driven at a place level. Thank, thank you very much. Going to move on now to look uh, further um, at uh, the, the effectiveness of devolution. Um, Baron Seaton, Margaret, over to you. Sorry, you're on mute, Margaret. Sorry, you're still on mute. I'm not, I'm not now. You're not now. <laughs> no, you're with no. us now. That's great. <laughs> um, how do you think the Cornwall devolution deal has worked in practice? Has it been effective in delivering for the region? And are there any ways in which you feel it could be improved? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Baroness Eaton. Um, so I thought Deborah's comment that she made around um, how the term devolution is used within the context of England is, is, is really worthy of picking up again because Cornwall's devolution deal, um, headed as a devolution deal, was largely around some delegation and decentralisation with um, no formal, if you like, real transfer of powers um, that required either primary or secondary uh, legislation. Um, and I think that we have used those freedoms and flexibilities and partnership working to, to good effect and Warwick Economics on behalf of government found that the Cornwall um, had one of the strongest track records in using and delivering its devolution uh, deal. And I think that perhaps the simplicity of our governance structure does help with that um, because we mm -hmm. um, do have a 
uh, we are uh, we have a strong unitary council covering a functional economic area so there hasn't been the same need if you like to create new regional governance structures to deliver our devolution deal and I think it's interesting that in government's thinking at the moment that they are recognizing that there are some areas such as Cornwall where you have a unitary covering a functional economic area that actually perhaps a combined authority mayoral model wouldn't necessarily um, add, add um, the leadership that is needed. So yes, I think it is, we, we have achieved a, a, you know, a lot. We've, we've used our deal to increase bus patronage, for example, against that backdrop of national decline. Um, we've leveraged uh, millions of pounds of private investment into our EcoFlex scheme, which has made lots of homes for vulnerable people in Cornwall cheaper to heat. Um, and uh, we've created a £40 million investment fund with the uh, British Business Bank, um, which I think is uh, really pleasing um, and a, a bit of a first for, for a rural area. And I think what we've tried to do in Cornwall is to try and set a template in the same way as West Midlands and uh, Greater Manchester have been doing for metropolitan areas, uh, for rural areas. So I think that I would say that government can proceed with confidence in devolving powers and funding to strong metropolitan areas in it, it uh, to, to strong unitaries in non-metropolitan areas. Because actually we've shown from the government's own research that we've been able to, to deliver and should be given kind of parity of consideration when it comes to capacity building. But I do think there is this need for government to really be clear about what is it trying to do at, through devolution. Um, because it, it, you know, it gets used to describe anything from one-off deals, um, allocating funding to projects to genuine devolution backed by legislative transfer of power. And that's a huge kind of spectrum in between. And I, I challenge from some, some of my local government colleagues but actually, we've also got to be a bit clearer about what we're seeing as being the right footprint and the basis for local government through which that actually devolution can take place too, because it's so variable kind of across the country. But in the context of Cornwall, I think our simplicity of our geography has assisted with this. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on now to uh, Baroness uh, Thornhill. Um, to, to look at the issue of, of unitary authorities. Uh, Dorothy. Thank, thank you. Kate, that was really quite inspiring. And, you know, you've clearly done some amazing things. I guess if you had a mayor, they'd probably need a mayoral helicopter in Cornwall to, to get around. So your comments about the geography are interesting. I'm really trying, with, you know, one of the things I want to get my head around is the the, the engagement, the issue about relationships between uh, the centre and uh, unitary authorities, um, you know, that whole relationship trust thing. Um, so from your perspective, what, what has worked and what actually would you really like to see changed in terms of that engagement? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, Cornwall, Cornwall was the second place after Greater Manchester to secure a devolution deal. And... Um, I think that that was incredibly useful to us because it it put us into a new set of discussions uh, with government, um, particularly um, uh, you know under the under the Cameron Osborne um, administrations, um, that uh, was really useful. And it also when our devolution deal was set up, there was an absolute kind of commitment within government to have a team of civil servants that faced to support the delivery of the Cornwall deal. Under Theresa May's government, some of that fell away. And actually it became back to trying to link in and have discussions with all the different departments, um, supported by a link person within, within the cities and local growth unit. But that sense that this was a team, a team between HM government and Cornwall, I think started to kind of fall away um, at that level. I think government's recognised that they want to look again at that and we've got the Heads of Place initiative underway uh, with an identified civil servant covering the region, so one for the southwest, that's a huge geography to be covering. But I think that 
genuinely um, the evolution was helped when there was a recognition of the importance of place. I think Cornwall was also helped because we were early, early kind of a, an, an early adopter, early front runner around this. And that's enabled us to stay in some of the discussions that have been useful. So Deborah and I are part of the local economic recovery group uh, and Cornwall has had a place there because of it having a devolution deal. But I do think that there is a risk that at the moment some of the, the agenda around devolution is being set in the context of metropolitan combined authority areas, the elected mayors, um, and uh, they are a powerful grouping and are doing some really great work. Um, but I think that that parity of esteem has to extend to all local authorities and not just metro mayors. Um, and I think that there's a, a risk sometimes that we have a default city thinking uh, within government. And I suppose we really want from a Cornwall perspective to be able to demonstrate that actually um, uh, there is complementarity um, uh, around how we work um, and um, uh, the opportunity, I think, for place leadership um, to take account of what's happening in cities, but also in areas such as Cornwall. Thank you. Could I just, just come in there and say, it, but, but it was your choice not to have a mayor, was it? Uh, and wouldn't it be, uh, wouldn't you be up there in the national news uh, with Cornwall um, setting out what it wanted to see uh, in, in going forward if you had a mayor who was a focal point that people would recognise? So um, I think that that's a really important question and one that we continue to uh, discuss uh, locally. So I think that uh, in the context of Cornwall, Cornwall is a recognised functional economic area in its own right. Um, so the need, if you like, to set a, an authority um, to cover a functional economic area that, that cuts across a number of upper tier local authorities um, it doesn't exist in the same way. Um, that we have a single LEP, we have a single um, uh, local nature partnership, which for us is a very important body. Um, we have, you know, a single CCG um, and health system. And uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a clear leader for, of Cornwall Council uh, who has that convening power within, within Cornwall. Um, we, on the back of our devolution deal, uh, undertook an independent governance review that we had um, national um, uh, uh, reviewers, commissioners uh, supporting us as well as local commissioners taking evidence about what works. And that led to the formation of the uh, Cornwall and Isles of City Leadership Board modelled on a combined authority um, that brings together some of our different partners. So our Police and Crime Commissioner, for example, also sits on that together with the chairman of the LEP chaired by the leader of the council with the Isles of Scilly council being represented on there with elected um, uh, uh, leaders being in the majority. And that is taking that overview and speaking with one voice on behalf of Cornwall. Um, I think what comes next in terms of the devolution discussion um, will be of interest. We're giving lots of evidence around that. And, you know, I think that there is a recognition in our discussion with uh, both ministers and with uh, senior officials, that actually um, uh, the, the, the need for an elected mayor where you have a strong unitary council with a strong identified leader um, is uh, less compelling than it is in other parts of the country. Um, but uh, yes, um, the case was made that we could deliver a devolution deal without the requirement of an elected mayor and the evidence is just that, that that has proven to be the case. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, m moving on, um, Councillor Maurice Surprise. Maurice. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I was really interested in that last, well, I've been interested in all the answers, but I was particularly interested in that last one because we can become a bit fixated on individuals and titles if we're not careful. Uh, and actually being able to turn around and say we were able to achieve all this in our own way without necessarily having an elected mayor um, is, is compelling when everyone seems, not everyone, when other areas seem to be thinking this is the only way we can do it. Given 
So I suppose the question is, because you have the questions in advance, given the unique nature of Cornwall as a region, and I think you've already described that, how can we ensure that devolution is able to deliver better outcomes to all the communities there? Yes, um, really important question. And um, when Warwick Economics, um, that were commissioned by government to help inform what happens next on devolution, they, they, did, uh, they surveyed businesses and they surveyed the public and they found that people in Cornwall are the most likely to agree from compared to the other uh, places with devolution deals that they surveyed that too many decisions affecting their area are made outside of it. Uh, a view expressed by 64%, almost two in three people in Cornwall. So I'd say that that's a pretty clear statement that devolution hasn't gone far enough and the forthcoming white paper is to be welcomed. So I think our experience shows that with a strong strategic authority, we can achieve, you know, a good deal with fairly limited devolution. But I would I would challenge and hope that the government will do more in terms of extending powers. But it's clear, too, that we as a place need to walk the talk as well and transfer power closer to local people. So. At the heart of what we've been doing in devolution in Cornwall has been our approach around double devolution. Um, so as well as securing powers from Whitehall, we're devolving powers to our 213 town and parish councils and community groups. So we think that that's had real benefits. So despite budget reductions, all of our libraries have been kept open, often with extended opening hours and increased levels of borrowing because they've been put under community control and MHCLG recently reported one example of this approach so um, and this was a, a running track in a in a local community in mid Cornwall it looked really in doubt but you know local gr dedicated group came forward and taken on the, on the running of that um, it's now a fantastic community run green space and sports facility and they've also then taken on the management of the local library. Um, so I think that there becomes an equal challenge for authorities such as my own around actually those things that are best delivered at the local level really being transferred. And, and I think that NALC um, and some of the work that we've been doing within Cornwall, um, we shouldn't forget that tier of local governance and community groups when we're talking about devolution. So I see us moving into that space much more as a, as a place convener, as a strategic authority, uh, helping the scales of Cornwall PLC to balance because they don't at the moment. Uh, the amount of money that Cornwall generates as a place is um, less than the cost of public service delivery. And I want to have discussions with government about how devolution helps those scales to balance. And then we look at transferring with a principle of su subsidiarity those local services that shouldn't be managed from Truro uh, for those services that are best overseen by Bude or by Penzance or by Salt Ash. Um, uh, and we have to walk, uh, 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 walk the talk as well in that regard. Thank you for that. Mr Chair, just a very, well, it's a point of clarification really. Um, um, Push, putting um, things down to parish and town councils, yes, of course, and community groups. Where, where's the accountability? Who oversees the community groups? Because, of course, um, excellent work, but not necessarily elected. So there must be a, a point of accountability for them, someone they have to report to, to ensure that, um, that, you, that the authority is satisfied with, the, with what's being done on behalf of the communities. Yeah, so, I mean, a really good example, for example, is uh, the Art Deco Lido in Penzance. And... Um, uh, uh, the Cornwall Council did a whole lot of uh, investment works after storms ravaged it so that actually it was uh, in use. Um, the, the parish council um, through Penzance Town Council um, uh, precepted to help to provide some of those running costs but actually it's now run by a social enterprise and a, and a community group and Cornwall Council has the previous asset owner uh, entered into agreements that effectively supported the transfer of that, of, that, uh, of that asset and was satisfied that um, the right due diligence was in place. And, and the town council who, you know, this is a statement piece of infrastructure within the town, 
uh, recognize the importance of it, uh, its future by looking at how they could support it through, um, you know, their, their local funding base. So um, we, we have sets of arrangements in place when we're working with community groups around supporting them with their governance, um, around using asset transfers as a way of, of making sure that we've got that capability and capacity there. And we've invested in local social enterprise groups that help organizations build that capacity so in Cornwall the real ideas organization supported for example the work on par running track uh, to help to build that that community-based uh, capability thank you that's very helpful thank you Kate thank you chair okay okay uh, well, we're, we're going to be quite constrained for, for time just for the, the end so can I just say to each of our witnesses very very briefly uh, one recommendation uh, to government that would have the most positive impact on devolution. If you want true recovery from COVID, both at a community and economic level, you need to be prepared to work with um, regions and local authorities to deliver the economic and community recovery plans that I, they have spent the last number of months developing collectively. Right. Okay. Uh, Kate? Um, I was struck by local authorities receive over 200 grants a year from across 14 different departments, each with their different sets of rules um, mm -hmm. and requirements. The opportunity around bringing those together and engaging on and how do we achieve better outcomes, I think would be a great place to start. Right, that's excellent. Of course, every, every one of those uh, grants is a, is a ministerial press release, isn't it? So, that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, right, uh, uh, just to follow up, uh, uh, Margaret, is there anything you else you want to come in with? Uh, any question, follow up question or, or, or Dorothy? Uh, Not particularly, Mar although I, I was gonna say, I, right, I, Dorothy. I was interested in, um, I wanted to hear Deborah's take. I was really heartened uh, by what Kate said about double devolution and work with Paris, yeah, parishes yeah. and all of that. But, and, and Deborah didn't touch on that quite so much. I wondered how that would work in an urban setting. So, so the, the issue about subsidiarity and double devolution is one that's very, very, um, uh, it's very important to us and is one that we're having at the moment and, and uh, our submission to the white paper consultation on levelling up and, and devolution contains a very clear ask of government ar around um, devolving down to the most appropriate level. And um, part of that was also on, you, you know, you can't de devolve powers down to a regional level or to local authority without sustainable funding. So hand in hand with that, uh, Baroness Thorn Thornhill was a very clear ask of devolved financing to enable um, local authorities to deliver these key critical services that we need to deliver. Right. So, so I, I think it works just as well in an urban setting or could work just as well in an urban setting as it would work when I was Chief Exec of the County Council working with districts and parish councils. Okay, thank you. Ma Margaret, anything you want to raise at the last? Sorry, Margaret, you're on mute. No, no I was also quite extremely no. interested in, in the fact that Cornwall could have devolution without a mayor. Uh, yes. Because I okay. think, uh, as, you know, it's interesting mm. that more than one model can work. Right. Mm. Morris, uh, any, any final ask? Uh, well, it's not so much an ask as a comment as... Um, it, it, this, it's been a great privilege and continues to be to sit on this panel because after four weeks as a leader of a local authority and a member of a county council um, I'm learning a great deal myself so if you see any good ideas in Hartsmere and Hart during the next couple of years um, you can take some of the credit I'm grateful to all the contributors uh, it's certainly a two-way street this I'm grateful to you Mr Chairman as well. Okay well, thank uh, uh, both the witnesses who were with us and, and Lord Moylan, who has uh, ha had to leave. Uh, that's really helpful to us to uh, collect this evidence, to listen to different views, and eventually come forward with uh, a, a report and a recommendation. Uh, and I think you can probably gather that uh, uh, 
uh, th those of us here are uh, interested in and committed to devolution. It's just a question of getting models which, which work and right. which we can persuade government to deliver on because yep. you know, in the end, unfortunately in a way, devolution depends on persuading the central power uh, to, to give and they're always great at doing that. So anyway, th thank you very much indeed. And that brings us to our, the end of our session today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.